Welcome to another edition of the SSPX Podcast, delivering sermons, lectures, and the spoken word from across the English-speaking world. Today, we're speaking again with Father Paul Robinson of Holy Cross Seminary in Goulburn, Australia. We have two questions for him this week from our listeners, but first, I wanted to dive in a little bit to a fairly public disagreement between a Catholic organization and Father, who wrote the book Realist Guide to Religion and Science. There were some fairly serious accusations leveled against him. So I wanted to bring those up and discuss it a little bit with him. Also this week, a listener asks for some help. He's using the 500-year-old writing from the popes called Quo Primum to defend the use of the traditional Latin mass. That argument is being refuted by a friend or a family member. We'll discuss that and more on the SSPX podcast. Another month has come and gone and we are already in the month of October, and welcome back to Father Paul Robinson from Holy Cross Seminary in Goulburn, Australia. How are you, Father? I'm doing well, Andrew. It's great to be back. Absolutely. Well, it's been a few weeks since we've talked. Any any new news from uh, from the seminary? Yes, there, there is. Uh, recently, at the end of the month of September, we had a uh, taking of the habit ceremony here at Holy Cross, the first time that's happened in 10 years. Oh, wow. So we were really excited about that. Uh, we had three brother postulants take the habit. There was a one Australian, uh, one Nigerian, and one Indian. So um, it's it's kind of a uh, a neat ceremony because um, the celebrant gives them their name and religion. And so there's this sort of pregnant pause. Everybody knows the brother postulants and their secular name, and uh, everybody's waiting to see what what name they're given in religion. So. Um, yeah, that, that was, I think, a, a special moment for the seminary because we haven't seen that ceremony in 10 years. That's great. Now, the, the SSPX brothers, are, do, they, do they choose their name or is that given to them by their spiritual director? Or What they do is they propose three names. Okay. Um, and those names are sent to the superior general and the superior general selects one of the three. Okay. Or yeah, the superior general also has the option of, of just giving them a name that's not on the list. Um, but uh, in, in this case, uh, yes, uh, for, for all of them, one of their three names was was selected. That's beautiful. Well, that's great. It's a, it's a beautiful feast and, and always happens on the Feast of St. Michael. So that's especially uh, nice for them. Yeah. Great. Well, I uh, wanted to get down to brass tacks and, and we do have a couple questions that I wanted to uh, get to with you, Father. Uh, but before, before we get to the questions from our faithful, I, I wanted to bring up something that's kind of intriguing regarding the book that you wrote, the Realist Guide to Religion and Science. Uh, there's been a bit of a, oh, I don't want to say a tiff, but maybe a tiff between uh, between yourself and and one of the, uh, I guess, centers for science, you know, Catholic study of science, and that is the, the Colby Center. Uh, they basically, in an article, came out and said that you were one of the people that St. Peter would have condemned uh, for preaching what you are what you are preaching in, in the book, uh, heavy stuff. Yes, absolutely. I um, the the Colby Center takes a a very we may say fundamentalist position. Uh, what they do is is they turn certain interpretations of the Bible into Catholic dogma, um, when in fact the Church has made clear that Catholics have freedom on the questions that, that they are dogmatizing. Um, so what that does is it sets up this, this uncomfortable situation where they have to accuse of, of heresy or at least of, of something close to heresy any Catholic who does not agree with them. And I, I happen to be one of those people who does not agree with them. And so uh, they read my book and, and they wrote a review on their website uh, criticizing, heavily criticizing my positions and not directly accusing me of heresy, but sort of implying that, that I had fallen into heresy in, in some respects uh, because I did not agree with their strictly literal interpretation of, of Genesis 1, which, uh, as I say, I mean, Catholics are, are very free on this question uh, to, for instance, um, hold that Genesis 1 allows for long periods of time. Um, the Pontifical Biblical Commission in 1909 said that we could interpret the word day in Genesis 1 each day as meaning uh, a long period of time or a certain period of time, uh, much more than, than 24 hours. 
But, um, yeah, the Colby Center kind of takes a, a position that, that, in my mind, really has its origin in the Protestant fundamentalists uh, in the United States when the fundamentalist movement got started in the 1910s and the 1920s. Um, with their, they had a, a series of tracts called the Fundamentals. Um, they, there was a, the word fundamentalist was coined by a, by a Baptist minister to describe their, their sort of movement. And, and part of that movement was to make the Bible a, a science book and to use the Bible to face the challenges that modern science was posing towards religion. And that's just simply not not a Catholic approach to to that question. Well, and, and this is something that, that we've talked about in, in the past, I mean, you and I, and, and I know in, in your book you dive into it in, in much more detail. Uh, I'm looking back here, see the interview that we published on June 25th of this year, uh, number four, Questions with Father number four. Mm -hmm. We talked about mm -hmm. almost this exact thing. Does the church weigh in on cosmology? Uh, and we talked about geocentrism. Does the church really weigh in on these on these top topics? And I'm, I'm quoting you from memory here, Father, uh, so I might be wrong, but I believe you said there's only two things that we have to take literally as dogmatic to believe as Catholics, and that is that Adam and Eve were our first parents and that God created us and everything. That's it. Everything else is basically in the realm of science. Am I remembering our conversation from the summer, right? Well, there, there are, in fact, a few other things that, that concern Adam and Eve uh, that we it's true that we have, must believe that they are our first parents, the parents of the whole human race, but also um, that they fell and sure. that their sin was communicated to us, uh, those sorts of things. But but effectively, yes, um, as far as that's that's more Genesis three. But uh, as far as Genesis one goes, um, yes, we must believe that there is a God who is transcendent to the universe, that he created all things, that he created them in time. Um, and, and really, beyond that, we can we have a certain freedom of interpretation as to uh, what sort of meaning um, is intended by God in the six day uh, schema for describing creation. Um, and, and really, Catholics have always had that freedom. But what what gets me is that um, the, the the Catholic fundamentalists, if you will, um, I prefer to call them. Catholic biblicist, um, they try to pretend that they've got the church on their side. And when I was, uh, you know, stationed here at, at Holy Cross, I was initially given the, the task of teaching both our introduction to scripture class and also um, the upper level scripture class where we go through the books of the Bible. And that required me to do a bit of research into the teaching of the church on, on these questions. And what I found was that um, the Catholic manuals uh, pre-Vatican II unanimously held that Catholics were free on the question of, of whether the universe is millions of years old or billions of years old or, or 6,000 years old. So these, these were not uh, questions that, that are settled by the Bible. The Bible is not teaching a certain age of the universe. Um, and I, what, what, after I, I did this research, and, um, I began to see a pattern, and I, I really couldn't find that sort of fundamentalist, biblicist position among authentic Orthodox Catholic teachers. And so one thing that that's, um, sort of said to myself when, when Colby, the Colby Center was criticizing my book, I, I said, you know, I bet that, that St. Maximilian Colby was was actually not in agreement with the Colby Center, huh. um, and so we we happen to have the collected works of Saint Maximilian Colby here in our library. So I went and, and looked at them, and and it was it was very comforting for me to find that his position is is almost exactly the same as as the position I expose in my book. On the one hand, he criticizes heavily Darwinian evolution, um, but purely on the side of science. He doesn't make use the Bible to criticize evolution. He uses science to criticize uh, Darwinian evolution. Um, he does use religion to criticize this sort of atheistic version of Darwinian evolution. Um, but then on the side of, of the universe, he, he held that, that the universe was, was millions of years old. 
And he didn't have any problem with that. He held that that the solar system formed from nebular matter um, a, a very, very long time ago, mil- millions of years ago or billions of years ago. And he really didn't have any problem with that. He didn't see any conflict with the faith. He didn't see it as destroying the truth of, of Scripture. He held, of course, as I do, that Scripture is inerrant. Um, it's just that Scripture is not teaching that the the universe is 6,000 years old or, or 13.7 billion years old or whatever. It's just right. not teaching that. So so it's not a dogma of faith. Right. And, and, and that's the thing that I think you're really trying to get out is we could have discussions all day long about science and what really happened and all of this type of material. But what you're, again, to put words in your mouth, Father, this is not really the realm of religion. Religion has a, a place for religion and, and the Catholic Church has certain dogmas that it, that it says that you must believe. And science, as long as it doesn't contradict what the dogma is, it's, it's free to believe what it does. And if things come up that prove certain uh, new new discoveries, then so be it. But that's the entire point of your book, isn't it? That that science, religion, they're totally compatible. And to try and twist things around into, well, you know, this must be wrong and heliocentrism, geocentrism, all this stuff, it, it just doesn't work. You have to do so many mental gymnastics to get to where you need to be in order to prove your own position that it's, it's almost kind of exhausting. <laughs> it's definitely exhausting. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, as you say, it it uh, requires so many gymnastics that it makes religion look uh, a bit ridiculous. It, it subjects the faith to to mockery on the part of of unbelievers, and this is something that especially Saint Augustine and Saint Thomas Aquinas warned us against. But right. in the end, for we as we as Catholics. Uh, interpret do not interpret the Bible on on our own lights. We go to the church to tell us how to interpret the Bible. The church teaches us what the meaning of the Bible is because she is a divine institution. And so, as Catholics, just out of deference to the church, we we should hold what the church holds that these uh, scientific questions these are scientific questions. These are not theological questions. And really, in, in my mind, there's a there's a certain lack of respect for the teaching of the church to, to try to pretend that they are uh, questions of faith. That, that it's more than what it really is, essentially. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I bring that up, Father, not to try and do a bully pulpit or, or, or mock this institution of, of the Colby Center or anything like that, but it, it seemed troubling to me, especially that, that quote that I mentioned at the beginning where they said that you were uh, towing the line of, line of heresy, and I, I just wanted to chat with you about that because... That, that, like I said at the very beginning, that's a heavy accusation, and I, I wanted to uh, just bring it up in case there are people out there who uh, happen to come across that and say, oh, no, I'm listening to a podcast with a heretic on it. So uh, no heresy. We, we pray on this one. <laughs> yeah, and, and as well, I mean, I think it's, it's important that, that people not be troubled in their faith unnecessarily. This, this can lead to a certain scruples. They might go on the Colby Center site and, and read something and, and ha- believe that, you know, unless they hold um, these strictly literal interpretations, that they might be defecting from the faith. Um, and when, in fact, that's that's not true. So I, I do think these these questions um, are definitely on the minds of a lot of people. And I am I, I think it's important that they know that, that the church does not bind them to, to that level and that they, they do have that freedom. So there's no need for them to be troubled in their conscience uh, about these things. They're, they're, they're uh, free to explore the scientific evidence for or against something like the Big Bang Theory. And they're, they're not going to defect from the faith right. uh, holding one way or the other. Well, th- thanks for that, Father. And. With that said, wanted to move on to, uh, I guess we have two questions I wanted to tackle today. Uh, one of them was, um, it sounds like the person who's asked this question is trying to defend uh, the traditional mass and traditional teaching uh, with maybe a friend or family member, I, I don't know. Uh, his question is, how would I counter these arguments? Uh, the first one is, many popes have broken with quo primum by changing the missile, and also that Pope Pius X went against quo primum by changing the breviary. So that's the question. I guess let's take a step back. Quo primum was an encyclical that basically brought and codified and brought together the the sacrifice of the mass and the liturgy and said, 
this is the liturgy you use. This is this is what you use from here on out. Because before that time, there were many different ways of of celebrating uh, the holy sacrifice of the mass. Is that a quick synopsis fairly accurate? Yes, that's that's correct. So it's a it was a papal bull issued issued in 1570, um, sort of a, a disciplinary legislative act on the part of St. Pius V in order to canonize the Mass. And by canonization, we, we mean sort of set it in stone. Um, and as you indicated, there were a lot of what were called liturgical uses back then, uh, various local customs, different ways of saying the Mass. And there was there was a, a little bit of chaos um, that, that was going on because of that. You would go to, to different dioceses, you didn't really know what to expect. I mean, obviously, the, the, it was not the, the great variety that you have today <laughs> with the Novus Ordo Mass. We really, really don't know what you're going to expect. Right. But there were just local customs. Um, these, these customs weren't against the faith, but they caused a certain chaos in the Mass. And so uh, Pius V wanted to canonize the Mass, to set it in stone and say, this is what it is. And he uses very strong language in Quo Primum, and saying that, you know, this is this shall be in force in perpetuity. Um, uh, the, the, the wrath of St. Peter and Paul will be will fall on, on those who dare change this missile and so on. And uh, what, what happens with the traditionalist movement is sometimes traditionalists interpret that document as meaning that the mass uh, can never be changed. That, that somehow St. Pius V was wanting to bind all of his successors in the papacy. Um, and so they use quo primum to say that the traditional mass effectively is the only mass that ever could be or, or, or will be um, to the end. And that any other legislative acts of, of the popes that try to introduce a, a new mass or that try to modify the old mass are illegitimate for that reason. Let me jump in real quick, Father, and, and ask, if you could clarify two points for me. And and one, that is, when you say that this is a disciplinary bull, uh, it's not that he's trying to discipline someone, it's that it's more about legislation, legislation. it's not about dogma. Uh, is that correct? That's correct. It, it more concerns the practices of the church rather than the doctrine of the church. Okay, and so when then when you said it's, it's not no one can ever change it, successors of Pius V, of Pope Pius V, could, when, when he was saying that no one could change it, when he was using that very strong language, who was he talking about, if if not the, the next popes coming down the line? Well, he was referring to those who were not in a position to, to do such things. Uh, for one thing, he was referring to the printers. Okay. <laughs> he specifically mentions the, the printers, you know, they were, they were to print exactly what he put. Uh, they weren't to, you know, do their own editing on the missile. But he was also referring to the people lower in the hierarchy. Um, he wasn't uh, wanting people um, like a, a bishop of a diocese or, or a certain cardinal or, or priest at their, at their parish taking the missile and, and modifying the missile. Um, certainly, the, the uh, St. Pius V was, was not anticipating uh, legislating to all of his successors, you know, as if he had a power that none of the other popes were having. Like right. he could, he could take power away from the other popes. He certainly wasn't wanting to set limits on the power of of future popes to either um, change that missile or to to bring in a different mass. Um, and that's precisely what what the questioner is is sort of highlighting. Because people are going to the questioner and saying, well, if, if you believe that quo primum uh, binds the future popes, how can it be that other popes have changed the missal, such, such as, as Pius X, St. Pius X, or um, other popes who have added saints to, to the missal, or the, the missal that we used in 1962 missal was changed by John XXIII. He added the name of St. Joseph to the canon, for instance. So how is it that, that these popes have changed what St. Pius V uh, established. If your argument is correct, that, that no popes are, can lawfully change the missile after St. Pius V. And what I'm saying is that this is just a, a wrong interpretation of Quo Primum. St. Pius V was not wanting to bind all of his successors. You can't change the missile. I see. So 
in in a sense, quo premium was was effective and 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 perfect for its time. And what it does is it says, this is the mass. There's nothing wrong with this mass. Use this one. Um, popes down the line can change it. So I guess we're left with two conclusions. One, that is to to use an argument of quo primum is there, so that's why we have to use this mass. It's kind of an ineffective argument because that's not really what quo primum does. Like you said, it doesn't it doesn't lock uh, the mass down. It's not an ineffective argument. It's it's the wrong argument to make with quo primum. So oh, we I do see. make an argument with quo primum. Um, it's is it's a different argument that we make with quo primum. What what we say is that the legislation of quo primum has never been abrogated. There was no official act of the church at the time of the council or after the council that said quo primum is no longer in force. Oh. And so what we argue is that since it was never abrogated, the right that quo primum gave to priests to celebrate the traditional mass is still there and that we have the right to, to celebrate that ch- traditional mass. I mean, the, the, the council or future pope could have said we um, – are superseding quo primum. Quo primum is no longer in force. And there's certain requirements that if you want to abrogate a law, you've got to mention it by name. They would have to mention quo primum by name. But they never did this. And we were I always see. arguing. I mean, the society was already always arguing and saying, look, quo primum is still in force until you do the actual official legislative act to get rid of that legislation. Um, but they've they've never done that. And meanwhile, it, with the Sumorum Pontificum of Benedict XVI, and, and this is this is a great victory for tradition, um, Benedict XVI explicitly said that quo primum had not been abrogated, or I should say more specifically that the traditional mass, the Tridentine mass had never been abrogated. He didn't mention quo primum, I don't think, right. but he said the traditional mass, uh, the Tridentine mass was never abrogated. And we're saying to ourselves, like, wow, <laughs> we were persecuted for about 40 years for, for saying this. Right. Um, and now the, the Pope is coming along and, and saying effectively that, that we were correct all along. That all along, we did have that right to say the traditional mass. So that was just a confirmation of, of the argument that we had been making on the basis of quote premium all those years. Very interesting. So so we could say the same thing in the, in the second part of this question from uh, the person who submitted this, Pope Pius X, went against Quo Primum by changing the breviary. Again, this is something that he was perfectly within his rights to do because he he could, uh, popes can change, they can add on when we're talking about something that's legislative, not dogmatic in a sense. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Very interesting. Well, uh, Father, thank you very much for the clarifications. Thank you for diving into uh, a couple of heavy topics, especially uh, you know, going going back into quo, quo primum back uh, about 500 years ago, and and bringing it forward to today. I, I know that that was uh, difficult to get done in in five or ten minutes, and uh, and and we sh- you shed a lot of light on it. So thank you very much for that. My pleasure. I, I look forward to chatting with you again soon, and uh, and and I hope you have a, a wonderful feast. Uh, I, I love this this week of the liturgical years: the Holy Guardian Angels, Saint Francis of Assisi, Saint Teresa of the Child Jesus. It's a it's a great liturgical week, and, and I hope the rest of October goes well for you and the seminary and Santa Holy Cross. Thank you so much, Andrew. I, I hope you have a, a great month of, of the angels and the Holy Rosary as well. All right. Thank you, Father. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe and rate the podcast so that more people can hear the beauty and truth of traditional Catholicism. For more news, resources, and updates, you can visit the U.S. District website at sspx.org or the English news website of the Society at fsspx.news.